parce que je suis en France, uh, je voudrais présenter en, fr en, France, en français, <laughs> mais je ne parle pas français. Uh, je sais seulement des fruits et des cannibalisme. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to be talking about um, the state of the Gopher, um, where the Go project has been, where the Go project is going, and I guess I guess where it currently is, and it's currently cute and fluffy. So um, maybe that's it. Um, I'm Brad. I, I've been working on a Go standard library since about um, 2010, um, May, so about four and a half years now. Uh, mostly the HTTP package, but pretty much I've touched about everything in uh, in the standard library and the build bot infrastructure and all this stuff. Um, my main project is camelystore.org, which is kind of like a life archivey backup search system that kind of does everything. It's all in Go, and I've also been working on it for about four and a half years. And that's what got me into Go, but I'm not talking about Camly Store. Um, so let's talk about Go. Let's talk about where Go came from. Um, before it was open sourced, around November of 2009, there were probably three to ten people inside Google using it, um, including like the main three. I'm not going to like redo the whole history of Go here. But in November of 2009, it was open sourced. There's this whole hey ho, let's go blog post. Um, the whole Go pun thing wasn't exhausted yet, so it was still fun to be like, let's go. But um, so this was the website in 2009. Um, you know, there's a little video of Ross being like, look how fast it compiles. And you know, it was advertising that you know, Go is simple and Go is fast and Go is safe and concurrent and fun and open source. And all these things are still true. It's actually uh, probably more true even than it was at the time. It is you know, more safe and more fun. And, um, so already in 2009, when it was open source, there were two compilers. There was uh, GC and GCC Go. Um, as an aside, when I write capital GC, which will be in this talk a lot, that is the garbage collector. And when I write lowercase GC, that is uh, the Go compiler, which is the kind of the main compiler you guys probably use, um, based originally on the Plan 9C compiler, but it's, it's drifted a lot since then. Um, so in 2009, there was Linux and Mac support for 32-bit x86 and 64-bit x86. And there was um, ARM Linux support, but it, it kind of sucked. Uh, but it, you know, it was, it was kind of functional. And there was the beginnings of, or there was NACL support, but it was a different NACL than exists today. NACL was being changed all the time. This is the, uh, the native client thing that lets you sandbox code. Um, GCC Go supported more things to various levels of completeness, various different operating systems and different processor architectures. Uh, in 2009, there was already GoFumped. Um, there was GoFix, which you guys probably don't use anymore, but it was very important at the time. And there was GoDoc, which is the same thing that runs uh, golang.org today. And it was the same thing that was running the website of the screenshots. Um, so at the open source time, we were running a, a Go binary serving the, the website of golang.org. So over time, we had various uh, releases that were important. Um, the first releases were the weekly releases. And they had names like weekly 2009, whatever. And the point of these was to break users only once a week rather than every day. And so that was, that was notable. Um, this is when GoFix came into the picture that when we did a backwards incompatible breaking change, we would try to write a GoFix rule for it. And then when users updated to the new code once a week, they could run GoFix and hopefully the program would still work. Um, then we had the monthly releases. These were like starting at R56 and going up to R60, I think was the last one. And then we would now only break users once a month. Um, so it started to like feel usable. Uh, this was still painful to write because we didn't have the Go tool yet and you had to use make files and all the, all the pain that goes with that. The notable release was Go 1.0 in, um, I guess that March of 2012. This is the release that introduced the error type, which was a built-in interface, which was a little weird and contentious, making some interface built-in. Previously, it was in the OS package, and you had to type os.error, which meant pretty much every program in the world had to import the OS package. Um, this is also a release that cleaned up the delete syntax. It used to be this weird thing where you had two things on the right side that was assigning to it to kind of mirror how you access when you check to see presence in a map, you say value comma OK equals map thing. And um, so they had decided to make it the same for deleting that you just always assign comma false. But it was kind of cumbersome when you had to write something like lat long and you had to make like a struct literal with nothing in it just to delete. So in Go 1, we now have delete. There's also the uh, stability promise document that um, these slides will be online so you know you can read that. That basically says we will not remove or change anything from the language of the standard library. So you can guarantee that programs written today will keep working. We could add things to the language, but 
and we could add we could add features to the language, we could add features to the standard library, but we won't break your programs. Um, and part of that was the API check tool, which goes over the standard library and emits a little line like this, you know, like in package net HTTP, there's a constant called status okay, and it's equal to 200, and it has type, you know, ideal int. It's a untyped constant, and there's, you know, a round trip, and so there's thousands and thousands of these lines. And whenever we do a release, it runs this, and we make sure that we never accidentally break an API. And it's caught us four or five times that we would have accidentally broken some user. Um, this is also a release that added the Go tool that you all know and love, go get, go build, go test, all that sort of stuff. So that lasted for about a year. And then a year later, we had Go 1.1. Uh, this is a release that added method values to the language. So you could basically curry the receiver by saying value dot method name, but without the parens, like in this final line where I have a once, and I pass s dot init to it. S dot init there is of type of func taking nothing, returning nothing, which is what async dot once wants, even though it's a method on S. So this is different than the method expressions. Anyway, it comes in useful for exactly this sort of pattern where you have a struct with a once embedded in it, and the first time you access some, some method on your struct, you want to like lazily initialize things. And it used to be cumbersome and kind of slow allocating garbage before. So that was a cute little feature. This is also the, uh, the release that added the terminating statement rule, so you didn't have to put panic unreachable at the end of all your funks. So if you had, you had a statement at the end that had a return on every case, um, or it looped forever, like infinite loop or something, then you didn't need to put a panic at the end. So that was a nice cleanup. Ints became larger. If you were on a 64-bit machine, um, you had a larger heap and you had big ints, 64-bit ints. Um, there was a bunch of performance things. The standard library grew a bunch. And we started to have the precise heap garbage collection, sometimes, most of the time, a little bit. So I want to talk about um, garbage collection, which is a big theme of upcoming releases. So previously, we Go had the most naive textbook garbage collector in the world. It was, it was stop the world conservative. So in con the conservative garbage collector, the program like stops the whole world and, well, that's not necessary for conservative, but we stopped the world and then we looked at every little bit of memory and said, are you a pointer, are you a pointer, are you a pointer? Where a pointer meant, eh, it was like an integer kind of in the right range, it was greater than this and less than this and kind of the, some of the bits were set in the right way. And so you kind of just looked at everything and said, you know, 74, is that a pointer? Nah, you know, 2 million something? Yeah, that looks like a pointer. And then you would not delete that stuff at the end of the marking. So this is fine on 64-bit integers because the numbers, the pointers, are large enough that statistically it just doesn't happen. But on 32-bit devices, like a bunch of the Windows users and all the people on ARM devices complained a lot that the garbage collector didn't seem to work because all it takes is a big, array of integers or points or some data file loaded into your program, and now all of a sudden you're pinning all your memory and everything just looks like accidentally it has a pointer that isn't really a pointer. In precise GC, on the other hand, the, the garbage collector knows for every little address in memory what exactly it's supposed to be. You know, this one's an int, this one's a pointer, this one's a string, a byte slice, and it only has to look exactly where the pointers are and it can skip everything else. So in Go 1.0, it already skipped byte slices and so it had that one optimization, but everything else was basically untyped. It was either a big byte slice or it was a bunch of pointers. So that's a bit of a simplification, but anyway. So this, every release kind of got a little bit better with uh, precise GC. In uh, Go 1.1, we started doing more precise GC on the heap. In um, Go 1.2, we decided that one year between releases was too long, so we switched to a six month release cycle. Um, the only language change in this release was the three index slice, so you can now set the capacity of a slice. Um, in this example, I make a little byte slice with length 10 but capacity 20. So it's actually allocating 20 bytes, but it's saying that the length is 10. And then normally you could append past 10 and it would just like, you know, bump, bump the length. Um, but in this example, I pass a slice to the function foo, and I say I want to make my, my slice start from index 10, and go to 12, but with, uh, or go to 15. Did I do that backwards? I don't know. Anyway, but you can actually restrict the memory that's available when you pass it down to somebody. So they can't accidentally walk past the memory that you've had. So this is good when you're writing your own memory allocators or something, and you have little pools, and you want to pass this to somebody and make sure that your caller, which could be another package, or it could be somebody else in the company that you've never met, you know, violates your rules and appends to it, and now this, they're trampling over some other memory of yours. So um, this function you know, would print that has length two and it has capacity five, but that foo function can never get at the last five bytes of s from the, from the caller's point of view. So 
That was a little language change, but one that I was really excited about. Um, and the scheduler started to be preempted, so you couldn't have one Go routine that was kind of looping around and like hogging the scheduling of all other Go routines. And we had the, the Go test coverage mode, so you could, you know, people like test coverage. It's cute. Um, Go 1.3 had no language changes. Um, it had some fun stuff, like you know, the sync package has synced up pool now, which is helpful for, for uh, controlling garbage. Um, there were a bunch of operating systems that were added support for, uh, another BSD, Dragonfly BSD, the Plan 9, which always kind of works, but always doesn't kind of work. It's, it's kind of funny that even though Go came out of a lot of Plan 9 people's work, the Plan 9 port has always kind of barely worked. And so, but it, you know, all the ports are unique butterflies in their own way, and they all kind of help the project find new different fun bugs. So it's, it's fun to watch them all. Uh, Go 1.3 also started to be precise of on the stack. So before all heap values that were kind of like what you would think of maybe as garbage or heap allocated, we would know the type of them. But if it was just some local variable, when we went to walk the stacks, we had no clue what it was. So um, 1.3, we pretty much all the time uh, knew what they were. And if we didn't, we fall back. We fell back to conservative collection. Uh, the only th other thing that was fun in Go 1.3 is we started moving away from segmented stacks. Um, so the reason the Go routines are so cheap is they have really lightweight stacks. So they only cost you know like 4K or something like that. Um, in Java and C++, they're typically gigantic, which is why threads are so he heavy and you can't have like millions of them or hundreds of thousands of them. So prior to Go 1.3 and 1.2 and below, we had like these little 4K stacks, and whenever you needed more, we would just allocate another one, and they would be all over the place in memory. And when you would like call a function and return from a function, you would just kind of like bounce around all over your stacks. Um, but this could really hurt sometimes when you got unlucky and you were like decoding JSON or decoding a JPEG, and you because of what your callers did, you know, tons of stack frames above you, the, your your decoding loop just happened to span the border of stack frames, and you would be bouncing back and forth between the stack frames in your inner loop. So this is, a, this is a graph of JSON decoding, and the red line is with Go 1.2 as a function of different initial stack sizes. Just instead of 4K, we just say, okay, what about you know, 2K, 6K, 7K, 7.5K? And you can see that the JSON performance is all over the place because sometimes it's getting lucky and sometimes it's getting unlucky. Uh, in Go 1.3, we instead start with a little stack and we just grow it and reallocate a new one and copy this stuff over there. But that requires that whenever it's growing it or shrinking it, it has to be really careful that if there is a pointer on the stack, the point, this pointer is rewritten to the new pointer on the new stack. If it's an integer, it can't touch it. So it absolutely needs to know um, for every position on the stack exactly what it is, which happens to also be what the garbage collector needs to know, because the garbage collector wants to be precise on the stack. So um, Go 1.3 started this, didn't quite finish it, but it, um, so now, now we're to the present. This is what, you know, hopefully you're all running in production, 1.3. Um, so compared to 2009, we have Windows support. That came like before Go 1.0. That was all done by the community. There's a whole bunch of BSD supports. I didn't dig up when those were all done, somewhere between 1.1 and 1.2 or something. Um, these other ones came in uh, Go 1.3, a lot more uh, ports. Um, we have a bunch more docs now, a bunch of blog articles. Um, Andrew and Francesc are really busy, and Rob writing a bunch of articles. But we have a community wiki with a bunch of resources. A bunch of books are out. Um, they've all covered this, but you know all the user accounts are kind of up and to the right. There's this blog post that had some graphs, some Olo. But if you look at GitHub commits and stars and forks, or if you look at a mailing list volume, it's you know, Golang Nuts is 10x bigger than it was when we, like a month after our release, and the dev list is way bigger. And so all these numbers keep going up, and internally we graph Google's internal usage, and they're all up and to the right, and the public usage is all up and to the right. So um, things seem healthy in the community. People are using it for lots of cloudy things. There was this article here, um, the emerging language of cloud infrastructure, that kind of drove home the point that sysadmins and DevOps sort of people love love Go, maybe it's, you know, because it's low level and you can do systemy things and you can, you know, get static binaries and whatnot. Everyone has their own reasons or maybe it's all of them. Uh, we're using it more and more inside Google too. I did a talk once about, um, I ported the Google download server from C++ to Go, the dl.google.com. Um, that went great. We're using it for all of our MySQL traffic to uh, on YouTube. It's all routed through a uh, Go proxy that understands the MySQL protocol and does fancy load balancing things. Um, we have a thing that, uh, an operating system that manages like Docker containers. So it's like Docker on a whole lots of machines, similar to how we, we work internally. Um, 
there's a bunch of conferences. The first one was uh, GoCon in Tokyo. Um, this March, there was GopherCon in Denver. Um, that was a giant venue, it was super fun. We're now here, hello. Um, there's one in India ne in February of next year. Um, there was a sweet bus at uh, GopherCon. I'm now actually using CoreOS. And CoreOS is like another operating system that basically boots and does nothing except for like Docker and you know cloudy things. You don't, you don't manage its state. It kind of boots up and you tell it what to do or it figures out what to do. Um, it's cool that we're now actually running build.golang.org, our build dashboard on CoreOS, and every build is running in a Docker container. So it's cool to see things we built in Go promote, you know, using products that are written in Go to help Go development. It's, it's a cool virtuous cycle. Um, this is build.golang.org. Uh, just across the top, you can see all like the operating systems and every architecture and variant of it. So like dozens of different like you know Linux combinations of 32-bit and different versions of Debian and with different options on and off on the compiler. And then every row going down is a different commit. Whatever. Typical continuous integration testy thing. Um, but the thing I like is all these tools are kind of starting to feed on themselves. At first, we had GoFompt and GoFix and stuff that relied on the fact that the Go standard library had the parser built in. And from the Go parser, you can get an AST, and then you can kind of like manipulate it. And then we had Go printer to print out the AST and get the code back. Um, but we would try to write go fix rules, and we wouldn't know the type information. So then we had go types, and then we could start to write go fix rules that were type aware. That helped a lot. And then we started doing things like I wrote the little go imports thing that would modify your imports. And um, people have been you know, going more and more crazy on this. I just heard about this go returns thing that um, uh, lets you be lazy and just type return error, even though you're returning like three or four different things. And it'll like put in the zero values of all the other things. And that's that's combining Go imports and Go types and all this stuff. So it, it's cool to see just like more and more tooling. Um, Alan Donovan's been going crazy with these packages. He's been doing EG, which is, um, if you're familiar with Java's Refaster, it lets you write an example of the old code that you had and an example of the new code that you want it to be like. And it does like pattern matching between the two and it refactors your code based on the example. Um, so that's EG, that's in the Go tools repo. There's also Go rename, which uh, Andrew showed before, that's you know, type where renaming. Um, there's this interpreter thing, the Oracle, you could ask it questions, and he's integrating, you could ask it questions about like what's under your cursor and where channel sends and receives come from. This is the thing that's now in GoDoc, if you run it in a GoDoc analysis mode or whatever, that you can jump to the definition and say what type, what interfaces does this implement, that's all the Oracle doing that, but that's just a library that you can use yourself too. So there, there's all sorts of crazy tools that are coming out, and they seem to be coming out faster nowadays. Um, anyway, so the future. Go 1.4 is coming out maybe around December 1st. It has fully precise GC of the stack and heap. Uh, the segmented stacks are totally gone now. The code's deleted. Conservative GC code is totally deleted. We always know for everything, everywhere in memory, exactly what everything is. Um, the runtime has been almost entirely converted from C to Go. So anytime your Go routine is running something in a stack, it's running Go code, so you know, maps, channels, interfaces, all this stuff. The only things still in C in the runtime are the garbage collector and the scheduler, and they probably won't last too long. Um, Go 1.4 is adding the beginnings of Android support, specifically writing games. Um, there's new ARM NACL support. There's internal packages. There's kind of like packages that only you can use, but you can't export, you don't export to other people. Right now it's locked down to only the standard library can use this while we see if we like it, but I think so far we like it, and it'll be available in 1.5 um, for, for general people to use in their Go path. Um, the syscall package is frozen. We've branched it out to Go sys where we'll let it be ugly there rather than be ugly in the standard library. Um, the pprof tool is no longer in Perl. It's now in Go, so that, that's good for Windows users or other people who don't have Perl installed. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of good stuff in Go 1.4. Um, Go 1.5, we don't know, but the main theme is that the GC will become concurrent. We actually have some guy who's a garbage collector expert working on this, and um, he's been working on Go 1.4 too, making sure that it's ready for Go 1.5. So now, like these little stop the world pauses that can sometimes suck if you have a big heap will be gone. Um, there's a roadmap for what the, the garbage collector will look like in 1.4, 1.5, and 1.6 and beyond at this Go link. But these slides will be online. It's it's a crazy document. Um, it looks like iOS support may come back. It was never merged in the main tree, but Minix did it a while ago, and it required all crazy sorts of jailbroken iPads and stuff at the time. But we don't allow runtime code generation anymore and we do the code signing now and we can like do objective C uh, 
see go linking and all this stuff. All the things that were in our way before are kind of gone. And once we have Android support, David Crawshaw, who's working on Android, um, wants to do iOS. So it's possible Go15 will have iOS support as well. That'd be neat. Um, it looks like we'll also have PowerPC64 and ARM64. Um, also, removing more C code, the linker was almost ready in Go1.4, didn't quite make it. Likewise, the assembler, the rewrite is pretty much done, but didn't make Go1.4. And the Go compiler itself is being translated from Go to C. Um, Russ Cox actually wrote a tool to mechanically convert it all based on our subset of C that we use in the compiler. And then it's going to go from this really ugly, horrific mess of C to a really horrific, ugly mess of Go. But then he's going to use all these fancy uh, tools like EG and Go rename and stuff to automatically refactor it in, into different packages and add tests. And we're going to unify all the compilers into kind of one compiler that shares my code. Then we could add new intermediate phases in, like uh, with SSA form. And then you could do all the classic compiler optimizations on the SSA form and we can get better code gen. So um, there, there's some good talks about this. Um, Dimitri also has been working on this tracing tool where he records all the events of a Go program at runtime, all like the scheduling switches, all the garbage collection events, creating new channels, sending things. And then he dumps it out into the same format that the uh, Chrome profiler uses. So you can actually interactively zoom in and inspect that. And you can see every processor, what it's doing when, the count of number of Go routines, and number of system calls, or number of threads and system calls. And you can just trace the flow of everything. So then um, he's working on like a NUMA aware scheduler, or he has a proposal one to, like, to keep Go routines from bouncing around CPUs and stuff, and to like, get better performance, better cache behavior out of things. Um, so Go 1.6 will be more garbage collector work, more optimizations in the compiler, um, maybe Pinnacle support, who knows. Um, if you come to Go next year, I'm sure there'll be talks about Go 1.6 because it'll be one month away at the time because we still do the six-month release cycle where we do three months of crazy development and then three months of stabilization. Um, Go 2, maybe we'll get that one day. Um, I liked Francesc's uh, talk about learning languages and learning... Uh, uh, learning computer languages versus natural languages. So maybe when we have French 2.0 with better spelling, maybe we can have Go 2.0. <laughs> um, so uh, out, outside of the core, uh, outside of the standard library, there's a whole bunch of work being done on libraries, which um, I'm working on HTTP 2 support, and that'll be eventually added to the main library. That's, that's like the new standardization of Speedy, basically. Um, I don't know, there's whole stuff of Unicode, mobile stuff, crypto stuff. All these, all these repos are very busy. Um, GCC Go, I didn't mention it much, but it's, it's keeping up with all the language changes. And um, they're better in lots of ways. GCC Go can do more operating systems and more processor architecture and do better code gen. But it, um, it lacks certain things that make GC really fast, um, the lowercase GC really fast. And it doesn't have good escape analysis or any escape analysis. And it, uh, its garbage collector is conservative. And so work is being done to work, improve both of those. Um, it's worth noting that we have basically three or four compilers that are all checking each other. We, or I guess three compilers. Go types is a full type checker for the language. GCC Go has its own, and GC has its own. So if we ever have a program that is different in any of those three cases, it's basically a bug. And then we look at the spec to see what does the spec say. If the spec is ambiguous, we fix the spec. And then we add more unit tests, so any compiler in the future has to you know, comply with all these. So all these things, the spec and the unit tests and go types, they're all kind of like helping each other and feeding on each other and uh, making sure, you know, keeping each other honest. Um, there's other fun compilers in development. Um, the ones I like are LLGo, which is the LLVM-based one that's written in Go that dumps out LLVM bit code. And then it targets like Pinnacle, so you could run it in, run it in Chrome. Pinnacle is the fourth type of NACL binary that is the LLVM-based one that then compiles down to one of the other three. And Chrome does that. So you ship this you know, portable native client thing, and then Chrome compiles it to whatever your device is using. Um, but anyway, we don't target that. We target the other ones. This one targets the fourth one. So crazy. Uh, TARDIS Go is a Go compiler that uses Go types and all the Go things. But it targets Haxy, or Hax, or however you pronounce it. And then from hacks, you can target just about everything, notably JavaScript. So you can run Go in the browser. Uh, there's also Go, Go for JS, which just goes directly from Go to JavaScript. And it is now a lot more compliant than it used to be. It does Go routines and all that stuff now. So I'm kind of actually jealous of all these compilers because they're written in Go and ours isn't. But um, hopefully, we'll catch up. Um, so in summary, because I'm supposed to have a summary slide, um, things are awesome. Things are getting cleaner and faster and more impressive. 
Um, so I don't know, it's hard to keep up with all the activity in the community. And so um, keep being awesome, keep doing awesome things. Uh, thank you. <laughs>